live from Times Square, crossroads of the World Wide Web, and sponsored in part by the Office of National Drug Control Policy. It's the Wrestling Observer Live with Dave Meltzer. How's it going, everybody? This is Dave Meltzer. We're finishing out the week here on Wrestling Observer Live. Brian Alvarez here for the next two hours. And uh, Jim Hurd, former Executive Vice President of World Championship Wrestling, will be our guest today. We'll be talking about uh, the history of WCW under the Turner Empire. We'll talk to uh, Jim Hurd, who was there at the very beginning, and maybe can point up some of the pitfalls that uh, went through uh, when he was there. It was uh, kind of a tumultuous uh, three-plus year period, which we'll talk about. We've got a lot of questions for him as well. And uh, anyway, he'll be here. I also want to remind everyone that we will not have a live show on Monday. We were scheduled to have Luthez, but due to President's Day, we're not going to be on. So Luthez will probably be rescheduled, hopefully, for the next couple of weeks. Uh, we will also probably, we will not be doing a live show on Wednesday. So next week, we'll only have three live shows. We'll do Tuesday, which will be Brian and myself, Thursday with Bad News Allen, and Friday with Bobby Heenan. And Thursday and Friday, I'll be doing the shows from... Atlantic City. So right. Uh, Dave, I just wanted to jump in real quick. Actually, next Wednesday's show will be a rebroadcast of Honky Tonk Man's appearance that was on this past Wednesday. So for those of you who missed it uh, this past week and can't get a chance to catch it on archive next Wednesday, that's the show we'll be running uh, while you'll be flying to New Jersey. And that's right, you'll be doing the show live uh, Thursday and Friday from the Trump Taj Mahal uh, Casino. And if anybody's in the New Jersey area, come on down to the Taj. We'll be in the Gold Room. Uh, Eddie Goldman will be doing his show beforehand. Um, and then you'll be doing it right after. And we might even, you know, Friday... Might be a full four hours of mixed martial arts fun. Okay, cool. And we got Brian here. Brian, what's going on today? Oh, not much. Oh, okay. Snowed in here in Seattle. I saw that. I saw that. You can't get out, or? No, I'm stuck. Oh, I don't know what God. I do right now, but I'm stuck. Okay. What do you think of SmackDown? I actually just got finished watching it, and I actually thought that SmackDown was a pretty enjoyable show. I don't know if it was because I watched it. Like during the day, and usually I watch it at night before I go to bed or what. But I thought uh, Chris Jericho and X Pac was pretty good. I thought uh, Austin and Benoit was good. I thought Rock and Helmsley was pretty good until uh, the finish. But I guess what are you going to do there? And um, overall, aside from the Vince McMahon Linda episode, uh, I thought it was a pretty good show. I enjoyed the show a lot. Uh, really enjoyed the Austin Benoit match. Thought it was the best TV match. The WF has put on in several weeks. I thought that Austin Benoit had a better TV match. Was it about two months ago when they wrestled on TV? Yeah. When they, 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 I thought that might have been um, a little bit better, but this was, to their credit, they did a totally different match. This was more of a brawl. The other one was more of a technical match and a real good one. So I thought that was the, the highlight of the show. That was the best TV match. You know, so um, let me see. The Vincent Linda stuff, I enjoyed it. In its own very bizarre way, I thought that Linda standing there in that trance was probably the best acting she's ever done. And Vince's acting was, how can I say this? It was so unbelievably bad that I got a kick out of it. It was, it was like so bad that you could almost believe this guy was maybe a little crazy. I guess. It was just, just so bad. the fact bad, that he kept but... yelling at her and yelling at her, despite the fact that she clearly, in the angle, couldn't hear, see, or even respond to anything he said. And it's like, why is this nut still talking to her? Because he's a nut. That's what I got out of it. <laughs> I thought the Mick Foley thing was really funny. Uh, in a, in, when he was in that deranged way. I don't know what it was, but when, he, when um, Al Snow was like telling him, well, don't you miss the pops? And he just puts on the VCR and they, <laughs> and they pop. Uh, that was kind of amusing. Uh, yeah, Jericho and X-Pac. I'm wondering why he gave him the gavel. Uh, he's going to come back and... What does Foley have to do anything? Well, that's... Okay, it's one of two things. Either it makes no sense, which is a possibility, or Al Snow's going to go in there so deranged thinking he's commissioner, but he's really not, as as a way to bring back McFoley. Hmm. I don't know. It's all going to happen... It's all going to happen Monday. I don't know why. I got this feeling they're going to do Angle and Benoit against Rock and Austin on Monday, which would probably be a hell of a match. Angle and Benoit. Yeah. Uh, hopefully they will. It'll kind of get Benoit to that kind of nowhere thing that he's in. Uh, let's yeah, there see was something about Big Show beating up about 15 men and that uh, was no that selling wasn't anything good. that uh, kind of rubbed me the wrong way. Well, I'll tell like, you what. What a way to kill the hardcore gimmick. I guess. I don't even know if you could call it that or just um, 
I don't know. There was just something about it. Hitting Big Show with everything, he would just stand there like King Kong, like ten men running in, he just beats them all up, and I just thought, what's the point of this? He's making a million dollars a year, and they're trying to make him worth it. <laughs> and it's just it's another... not going to work. Well, it's I just hate that like... argument where, okay, this guy It's is just the latest stuff. experiment. This guy they're going to keep trying. So we have to push him. And I think that's well, so lame. It's like, if everybody doesn't like this guy, like Hulk Hogan, Hogan's drawing power um, was nothing. So are you really justifying his paycheck by putting him in the main event if he's killing business? No. Okay, okay, I know. I, I understand your logic and you're right, but that's not how the way corporate America thinks. You know, I mean, Vince McMahon, every every week when he's writing that $20,000 paycheck to the big shows, going like, i, I got to make him worth this. <laughs> and it's, he's not. <laughs> so what are we going to do? It's like, well, the heel thing isn't working, so let's make him a monster baby face. Let's turn him into Andre the Giant for the 40th time. And it's not, you know, what can I say? Maybe start winning a bunch of battle royals. That's all he'll do. Oh, I hate battle royals. But, but um, I thought that he was... I thought that he was more effective last night than he'd been as a heel, if nothing else. I mean, I, I, I mean the one thing that Big Show, I think, is pretty good at is that I think there's a baby face when he's beaten up and he he shows good fire in his comebacks. Mm -hmm. So beating him up like that and doing that half-ass no-selling, I think that's that's all right. I, I mean, although the segment itself, running all those guys in and, you know, Kai and Ty taking that double choke slam bump and all that, I thought that was totally goofy. Mm -hmm. uh, there was something else on the show. I, the one thing that I didn't like, that I didn't like on the show, was Kane and Edge. I just thought that, that was I mean, it's like, it was, uh, it was too much. I mean, I can understand that they want to make Undertaker and Kane into this monster tag team, you know, going into the pay-per-view where you think they're just totally unbeatable, and Edge and Christian have to bump for them to do that. But it doesn't have to be two minutes, and they can at least get a little bit of offense in. I mean, it wasn't even, it wasn't so bad that just Kane squashed Edge, but you got Undertaker squashing Christian, they're not even in a match. Yeah, on the outside, just pummeling him. I mean, there at least could have been something where where Christian like caused, you know, Kane to get distracted, and 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 Edge got a lot of heat built up on Kane before he made a comeback, and then Undertaker had a reason to attack Christian, but he just beat Christian up before Christian did anything effective as far as a run in, and it was just like when it was over, I don't think it helped Undertaker and Kane at all, and I think it hurt Edge and Christian a lot, and I think so. That, that's the kind of stuff where well, I'll say a Dudley's come out with that table and they put it at ringside, and Kane goes through it, which is the Dudley's gimmick. And he just hops right back up and gets back in the ring like it's nothing. And I thought, why would you do that to the Dudley's table gimmick? Make it look so ineffective. Yeah. yeah the other thing also is the table didn't break, and then Michael Cole goes, he went through a table. <laughs> 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 Poor Michael Cole. He was terrible last night, by the way. What did um, Jerry Lawler say? Saturn did some move, and Jerry Lawler just made a... Jerry totally Lawler called it some move, and I don't know what the hell he was talking about. And he said it three times. Yeah, I thought, he's just got to be making fun of Michael Cole. I guess. I don't know what that was. I didn't know what was up with that, but I was laughing. I was going, yeah, that's good. And Michael Cole yeah. actually, uh, I can't remember what the move was, but Michael Cole actually identified it afterwards. I was Death Valley Driver. Yeah, it was Death Valley Driver. That's right. Yeah. Austin um, Austin was the one who was uh, who, who in the main event kept insulting Michael Cole, right? Yeah. Was it? The frosty yeah, that was hair. Pr frosty hair and all that. Yeah, I thought that was kind of cute. And uh, I, I did not enjoy in any way, shape, or form watching a uh, poor Kevin Kelly have to humiliate himself on national television. Well, it's going to happen. I know. It's it's people's sixth sense of humor. Poor Kevin. Well, he's got a job. What the hell? Yeah. It's just it just shows to, it just goes to show that uh, when you sign for the, to work for the World Wrestling Federation, you are in fact signing your dignity away. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I mean that's it's, Howard Finkel. I, oh, any of those people. Uh, let's see. Anything else you want to talk about the show? Uh, I don't think so. Okay. Major. Uh, let's get a couple of news notes from Japan. The March 2nd, 01 pay per view main event going to be Shinya Hashimoto and Yuji Nagata against Mitsuharu Misawa and Jun Akiyama at Sumo Hall. And you know, I think that's going to be like a totally awesome match. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I watched, actually, I just got the tape the other day of the match where they did the tag match with Misawa and Hashimoto from last month. And it was actually quite disappointing. The heat was tremendous, but. It's like Hashimoto has seen better days, and Misawa has really seen better days. But they really um, line them up with some tag partners. I mean, Yuji Nagata and Jun Akiyama, they can carry that match. And I think Akiyama is certainly more than good enough to have you know great sequences with Hashimoto. And all they had to do is keep Misawa and Hashimoto you know, to do a few spots during that whole match, which they can do, and they'll have so much heat if they keep them out of the ring most of the way. Uh, I think that's going to be a total kick-ass match. How did Kawada escape unscathed? 
In what sense? I should say unscathed, but uh, what do you mean Masawa unscathed? falling apart and Kabashi falling apart and. Uh, well, he fell. Remember his eyes and everything. He was he, he missed all of last year. I guess that's right. He had two eye surgeries. He didn't unscathed. He's still going Although, though. He's awesome. You don't look at him and go, man, this dude is just, he's done. No, but Kobashi didn't really, other than the fact he couldn't walk. Well, that's... <laughs> other than that. <laughs> I mean, Masao, now Masao is just a shell. I mean, oh, it's just it's just painful to watch him. Uh, let's see, Kenzo Suzuki's off the pay-per-view, which is New Japan on Sunday. Uh, Scott Hall will be going on the March tour for real to New Japan. That's a, that's a for real. It, it hasn't been announced yet, but... <laughs> for real. Uh... Yeah, for real. SmackDown did a 4.3 rating, so it finished in fourth place. That's better than it's done the previous two weeks against that very strong competition. It was a pretty Obviously. packed show, though. Yeah, you're right. It was I, like, I think show. it was better. Yeah, Austin, I think Austin it was better Benoit. it than uh, just, you know, the promotion they did for the SmackDown Extreme that, you know, they didn't really put anything on the show. Well, I mean, we hey, there's a lesson. They promoted the hell out of SmackDown Extreme and did a 4.0. And in this one, they didn't promote at all, but they gave you uh, Rock against Benoit. I mean, Rock against Helmsley and, and Benoit against Austin into four three. And they delivered so them. Yeah. So that's. But they they gave you they opened the show and they told you there, there's going to be two matches that people evidently wanted to see at least a little bit. Um, let's see. Let's see. Friends got beat by um, uh, what's what was it? Friends got beat by Survivor again. Uh, the gimmick or the the margin was close. Pride, March 25th at the Saitama Super Arena, announced three matches. Uh, could be really interesting. Uh, Kazushi Sakuraba against Vanderlei Silva as as the main event, or I guess the announced main event so far. And I am really surprised at this match being made, just because this is a real, this is the way they match up. This is a really tough fight for Silva. I mean, for, uh, for well, it is for Silva too, obviously, but for Sakuraba, for both for both guys. I mean, it's. Uh, Silva is a really good striker, and in his last Pride match with Dan Henderson, who is an Olympic caliber wrestler, in fact, wrestled in the Olympics, uh, Henderson had a hard time with Silva taking him down, and in most of the way, every time Henderson went for a takedown, Silva ended up sprawling and getting on top and pounding on him and, and beating him in a decision in what was a hell of a fight, by the way. Um, and Sakuraba is not the wrestler Dan Henderson is, although Sakuraba's actual wrestling ability is very underrated. He's, he's really good at, at wrestling. Striking, you know, Silva's got Sakuraba beat. This is a really, this is going to be a hell of a tough fight. Um, Ken Shamrock, Igor Vovchanjan, which we talked about earlier in the week. Uh, that could be a really good fight if, uh, you know, Shamrock, well, I think we're going to have Shamrock on the show in the next couple weeks, by the way. Um, uh, but but um, that that is a really interesting fight, too, because I don't know that Shamrock's going to... Shamrock probably can take Vovchanchin down. He's a good enough wrestler to do that. But um, that's... I don't know. Standing up, uh, it'll be interesting. Uh, Vovchanchin's harder hitter than Shamrock. Um, and there's conditioning's always a factor, too. Henzo Gracie and Dan Henderson, which is another great... That's a great match on paper, too. So good show. Uh, they announced... Let's see, Mark Coleman, Heath Herring, Guy Metzger, Tadao Yasuda, Kira Shoji, Alexander Otsuka, and Masaki Satake. I will presume... I haven't been told this officially, but I'm presuming that that show will air on pay-per-view in the United States uh, probably about a week or two later, probably early April. So, uh, it's going on there. Uh, let's see what else we have. Um, poll for today. Uh, who would you rank? This actually will be for the whole weekend. Uh, who will you rank as the greatest British wrestler who is a star internationally? A. Billy Robinson, B. Steve Regal, or William Regal if you prefer, but I called him Steve. Uh, C. Dynamite Kid, D. Davy Boy Smith, and E. Burt Aserati. Where's Loch Ness? Uh, <laughs> he was the one that didn't make the cut. It was oh. between him and him and that Dynamite Kid. I couldn't figure out who was the better worker of the two. Uh, what else? Um, any? Uh, let's see. Rey Mysterio tonight. Rey Mysterio Jr., Santo, and uh, Sakosis have a three-way in Tijuana. Oh God, Tijuana has some great matches. And uh, let's see, New Japan, of course, pay-per-view Sunday, Super Brawl Sunday, uh, which, of course, um, Scott, 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 uh, Scott Steiner and Kevin Nash main event. Uh, what else? A couple of changes in the pride rules. Um, minor change. It used to be, the, the way they did the time limit was the matches would have two 10-minute time limits. I mean, two 10-minute rounds. And then if the judges either could vote for a decision if it was one side or if it was close, they would vote a draw and then would go to a five-minute overtime, and then they would pick a winner after that. Now it's going to be three rounds. 
The first round will be ten minutes, the second round will be five minutes, and the third round will be five minutes, and then the judges must pick a winner, which means the matches go 20 minutes max. There was no 25-minute matches. And they also are giving the referees discretion to give yellow cards for stalling, which means that when you do that, you lose a point, which encourages aggressiveness. So that's probably a good rule. And they are allowing knees and kicking of an opponent when an opponent is down on all fours, which is a rule that I huh. really don't like. Uh, the idea that you can the why guy do they can decide be down to do off, that? Uh, I don't. I do not know. I think because probably somebody protested that it's you know it's I don't know it's legal in Brazil I cannot or do something. enough damage in these fights. No, the, the kicking a guy in the face uh, when he's down, and also you can kick him with shoes because they're allowing kicking with shoes now. That one scares me because you can really you can really hurt somebody doing that one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that one I was. I was really concerned with that. Sabu and Rob Van Dam start with uh, All Japan on Sunday. Rob Van Dam's first time back in all, in all Japan, in fact, in Japan at all, in almost four years. So that's what's uh, that's going on there. Yesterday's poll about ECW. What do you think about ECW's future on pay-per-view? Uh, the show on March 11th will be the last pay-per-view show, 44%. Whoa. Uh, there, will be, there will be one last show, but it will not be on March 11th, 10%. They will be running many more pay-per-view shows, 6%. Boy, that's not encouraging at all, uh, that feeling. And they will never run another pay-per-view show again, 40%. <laughs> there you go. That's the one right there. Yeah. Well, no, that's not encouraging either, yeah. Uh, Warlord's in, in jail in Virginia. Um, he was arrested in 1997 on charges that he possessed steroids with an intention to distribute. No way. No way. <laughs> that, that's shocking. And he was, uh, that was in Virginia, and he was living in Florida, and he tried to buy a gun in Florida, and they found out he had that, uh, uh, whatever it was, he had that charge against him. Up for his arrest. Yeah, that, that warrant, and, uh, he spent three weeks in jail in Broward County, probably just got out, uh, got out on February 8th, actually, so it was a week ago, and he surrendered, uh, in Virginia. So, anyway, that's what's, that's what's going Isn't on. Isn't he hit by Any the milk truck? What? Was that Warlord that was hit by the milk truck? Um, or Pete's truck. I'm not sure if it was milk truck or Pete's. I think it was Pete's delivery. So, didn't he go to court for that or something? There was a, definitely a lawsuit out because they asked me to be like... How could he file a lawsuit and he had a warrant out for his arrest and they couldn't find him? You ever seen those shows? This has nothing to do with wrestling. The shows where, where like, they'll, they'll find these people with, like, that, that have jumped bail or, um, or, 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 you know, haven't checked in for parole. And they're just walking the streets, and like some TV news crew will like find five guys that the government can't find, like in like you know like not even trying hard to find them, you know like. So th there's your answer. Well, that explains a lot. Yeah, they're not trying hard. Uh, let's see. Anything else to get to before we start with emails? No. All right. So, what tape would you recommend for someone who's never seen Mexican wrestling? I would say When Worlds Collide pay per view would be the one to get. And the main reason I say that is because the commentary is in English. And also, it's an awesome show. But the commentary is in English, so it's just it, it's, it's just easier to, to follow and everything. And also, the commentary is pretty awesome on that show. Uh, it's just easier to follow that way rather than watching a show in Spanish. If you want to watch something modern, because that's seven years, six and a half years old Especially if you understand now. the rules. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's all explained. Uh, if you just want to watch something modern, I would say the March 17th, the first EMLL pay-per-view. Um, because that may have been the best pay-per-view of the year. I think it, I think I voted in the Observer Poll show of the year. And, uh, it was pretty darn close if, uh, you know. It's from Josh. How can a fired Mick Foley get Al Snow the commissioner's job? Does Deborah, the still assistant commissioner, have the power to give Snow the spot? Uh, yeah, what too much logic. To Deborah? I don't know. She was terrible. <laughs> well, she just vanished. Maybe, maybe that's, maybe that's the reason. You know? She rules herself off TV. Yes. Uh, let's see. Um, this is someone who is... Long article, long letter. Probably too long to read, unfortunately, about uh, WCW. Um, but it basically says the same thing that everyone else says. But um, it's good. Let's see. I've heard enough talk. I'll go, I'll go through to the break. I finally heard enough talking. I don't believe a word of it anymore. It's hard for me to believe that the people still buy the ridiculous notion that Eric Bischoff has returned to once and for all save WCW from the abyss of chaos that it has drowned himself in for the last two years. I can understand if this was the first time we were strung along with the belief that Bischoff, who was responsible for the only wave of true success the company's ever seen, was finally coming home to make right the atrocities that were bestowed upon his precious wrestling promotion. But this is not the first time. No, it's not. Oh, no. 
I feel like I'm in a time warp because I could bet my life that I've heard this whole story before. A few short months ago, Eric Bischoff was heralded as the winning formula to bring WCW back to prominence. Um, who Bischoff him? and Russo together. Well, do you remember when Bischoff and Russo came in together, what we said here? We said that they weren't going to last seven weeks, and they may have lasted seven, but they didn't last much longer, and that it was a losing formula. So it wasn't me who's, but I know people were heralding that. that the Bischoff and Russo I knew had no chance. Um, <laughs> Just because I knew they couldn't get along. There was just no way. What followed was some of the most disheartening and revolting wrestling I have ever been fortunate enough to endure. I cannot disagree. Fortunate enough? Unfortunate enough. Okay. Yeah, I, I can't disagree. Of course, everybody knew it was all Vince Russo who fouled things up. I mean, new, the new blood, the cruiserweights, WCW world champion David Arquette, that was all Russo. Bischoff was only in charge of the entire company and full authority to nix any and all of those things from happening. But apparently... We have forgiven him. Okay, I can live with that. If only it was that. Have we all forgotten who made Kevin Nash the booker? The man has tanked two wrestling promotions, ruined what could have been the next used phenomenon in wrestling, and did the job for the world title after getting tapped by, his in by another guy's index finger. Okay, so that was a mistake, too. Fine, I'll forgive him for that. Then I'm listening to Wrestling Observer Live, and I hear Eric Bischoff remarking about how we were being treated to a new Kevin Nash. A man with drive and fire and not the lazy beer-drinking Kevin Nash we've been seeing. Just I like the fact how, well, I just want to mention something. Bischoff never specified what it was that, that Nash was doing different. He just goes, you'd have to look really closely to see these things that Nash is doing differently. And I swear I was thinking, I bet Bischoff was talking about him, like, um, dyeing the gray out of his hair. So, like, no, 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 no. If you, if, you, if, you look, if you look, the one thing, Kevin Nash has been going to the gym. Yeah, but he was going to the gym before. Remember we were talking, like, uh, two or three months ago. Nash yeah, yeah, he went, suddenly, he went, he, just all he suddenly turned, yeah, he suddenly, transformed in like a week. Yeah, he suddenly transformed in a week, he got a tan, he that did whatever he did. Bischoff came back. Right, and then he kind of let it go, and then in the last week or two, or so, since Bischoff's been back, he's gone back, he's gone back and started training hard and whatever else. Yes. Um, you're right, he did that, he did that for a couple weeks before. Hey, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be defending Kevin Nash <laughs> for anything. There's really nothing, I, I guess I'm not going to rush through the rest of this letter because it's, it's just huge, and it basically, the main gist of it we've already talked about. We can put it on the website. Um, actually, well, they didn't send it to the website, but uh, let's see, this is uh, from Todd Ferretti who goes, I just want to say I thought the show with Honky Tonk Man was great. I have a question regarding what Honky had to say about David Schultz. What was the deal with Schultz thinking up WrestleMania? I've never heard this before. Can you explain? I've never heard it before either, and I was quite shocked to hear it. I don't know what that is. Um, well, Schultz I don't know. what? Well, he said that uh, David Schultz was the one who came up with the idea for WrestleMania. Oh yeah, yeah. Well, I never, I never heard that story before. I think when, um, in a couple weeks, I think when um, Basil DeVito's book on the history of WrestleMania is written, somehow I think that the idea that David Schultz came up with it may, may not be in the history of WrestleMania. Come on now. You, you think you think they're going to? They don't say change history. Okay. Uh, after watching SmackDown last night, it's from Bob McCandowitz, it seems like the WF has found the perfect role for the incredible acting talents of Linda McMahon. If Stephanie could play a similar role, I would be beyond happy. Yes, many people would. Uh, let's see. Uh, Eric from Freeman You know, says, I am such a big fan of Steve Regal. Yeah, he was so awesome last night when he just shoves Trish in the limo and he just, in the happiest voice, just goes, Vince, I think you should let them fight. It was so awesome. <laughs> Actually, you know what? Vince was really good there then, too. Yeah. You know where Vince is like the light bulb hits? Yeah. You know, it's like, think of all the money that can be made on pay-per-view. And then, yep. like, Vince is like these two women that he supposedly loves. You know what I mean? And he's going like, oh, but I can make money on pay-per-view. Let him fight. It's because it was so realistic, you know? <laughs> yeah, that was that was. Vince's real thoughts. My God, I could make money. Yep. Uh, Eric from Fremont, will China allow Lita to surpass her in the female popularity ranks, or will she turn into a female Hogan? I think it's out of her control. I think what's going to happen is just going to... China doesn't have the power to stop. If it happens, it happens, you know? Um, I think it's going to happen, too. Uh, it goes, doesn't Big Show look like Earthquake with his new tights and bad tiger tattoo? All he needs is bad music. <laughs> well, worse music he's got now and a beard. Okay. Uh, whatever they, Jerry Lawler called the move was the thing that Taz has started on Heat. So Taz has been saying this. A couple people emailed that, that Taz has been calling the move that same thing for a couple of weeks. Okay. It's probably a rib on Perry Saturn, because Taz and Saturn have had a love-hate relationship for a while anyway. Uh, I don't know if it's Perry Saturn's preference or not, but Taz said that every time on Heat when Saturn wrestles, uh, let's see, there's another person saying the same thing. Nobody actually knows the name of what he says, but everyone knows <laughs> that he says it. Um, That's why funny, because Ross said it like three times, and no one can still figure out what the hell he said. Yeah. 
Why does everyone get on Bischoff's case about always saying the right thing? Jim Ross's weekly Ross report does nothing but try to kiss the fans on the net, like anyone believes the WF is going to have a good light heavyweight division. Well, I think the, the difference is, is that the WF is right now a successful company, so they have more leeway. More leeway. Actually, we, we get on Ross when he gets a little bit too, too, too much like that. Plus, Ross does um, not have the power to make the cruiserweight division if he wanted to. That's right, and Eric, Eric does. Good point. Please give your pride picks for the currently announced matches. Oh, God. Let's I think you did that earlier, didn't you? I gave my thoughts. I didn't give picks. They are so hard to pick. Wow. Jim Hurd's on the line. Let's see, i got to pick these matches first. Uh, let's see. Silva and Sakuraba. Sakuraba. Uh, Silva. Okay. Mm -hmm. Uh, we go with an upset there. Okay, um, Henzo Gracie and Dan Henderson. God, that's hard. Great. That is so hard. Yeah, I'll go with Gracie, too. But that's hard. That one could go either way. And... Uh, Ken Shamrock and Igor. Igor. Hmm. It's tough. They're all tough. Yeah. I'll go with, uh, I'll go with Igor. Okay. We've got Jim Hurd on the line. Jim, how are you today? Where's Jim? Hello. Hey, Jim. Hey, Jim. David. Hey, how are you? I'm fine. How are you? Hey, I'm doing pretty good. I'm doing pretty good. That's great. What have you been doing? What have you been doing for the last five years? Well, just kind of sitting back and uh, in retirement, and, and watching what some of these guys put out for uh, for uh, what they call a an angle and uh, and goofing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, really, I've I've been a various a bunch of stuff doing some marketing for some friends of mine and all, and and some golf courses, one in Houston and. One outside of Chicago and one in Indianapolis, and and doing some marketing for those guys, and uh, just uh, taking it easy, really, no big, uh, no big deal. Retired and and uh, and uh, kind of loving every minute of it. But I, I've kept some touch with uh, with especially uh, with you and uh, on your end, not with you, but watching you. And I want to congratulate you on a great website and a great radio or internet radio. A breakthrough type thing, and uh, and obviously you're onward and upward. Well, thanks very much. Um, for the for people who don't know, Jim Hurd was uh, executive vice president, ran World Championship Wrestling from the end of 1988, right after the sale to Turner from Jim Crockett, through early 1992, and uh, was going back with the company. I mean, one of the reasons why I wanted you on was the company just being sold. The sale's not officially. Uh, what's it called? Finalized, but it's been announced to uh, right. Eric Bischoff and Fusion from Turner. You know, it's like they had the company for 12 years, and oh, it was a struggle. You know, they had a couple of good years, but financially, it was a struggle the whole way. Looking back with what you know now and and what you went through, uh, what do you think were the were the weaknesses of the Turner system and why the thing? Because because on paper, you would think being part of a big media company. I mean, it was it was the best position that a wrestling company had ever been in, but it really never it never really clicked. Well, uh, you have to look at a couple of things. Uh, the entire premise originally, uh, and my first of course, I've known Ted uh, since we we formed the Independent Television uh, Association uh, years ago in 1970. Actually, INTV. Uh, the premise was, and it never happened, that that we would have uh, the support of uh, all the various networks, uh, not only CNN, uh, but uh, you know the uh, the other networks that were uh, were available to us. And none of that ever happened. We were shunned by uh, not only the sports department of Turner, uh, but every other uh, every other facet of broadcast. That uh, that was available. Uh, they uh, they would not run our promos. They would not allow us. I mean, Nitro uh, on Monday night would would have been unheard of. And uh, so we we had to struggle along trying to make our own way against a, a powerhouse like Vince's that, that that Vince had in place. 
uh, with all the major stars, uh, and uh, we had uh, we had inherited obviously Flair and Luger and and Sting and the Steiner brothers, uh, to name a few, uh, which were the which was our entire nucleus, uh, and uh, and and were commanded to uh, to do a lot more wrestling and a, a, a heck of a lot less. Uh, 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 oh, I guess if you will. Uh, bodily function type things on the air and and using uh, language and so forth and so on. I mean that uh, we were handicapped to that degree, which they're not. Uh, it's that's that the era is gone, and 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 they've been able to fight their way through the hierarchy at uh, at Turner and uh, were promoted on all the various networks and and all. I can remember when when I did WNN News. Uh, just to kind of try to marry the rest of the the networks that that were under Turner's leadership, uh, we had to go all the way to the top guy at CNN News. He raised so much hell. Finally, when we convinced him that we were going to do a legitimate wrestling news five or eight minute show that included uh, re- news about wrestlers that were not only with our organization but. We're with the WWF and uh, and all. Uh, uh, they la- they allowed us to do it. Those five minute increments that that I put in were obviously things that uh, would take up some time, so we didn't have to beat the hell out of each other for uh, two hours or two and a half hours all the time, and and, and kill young jambronis that we were using, and uh, and those things. Uh, it went by the wayside, and, and of course they had powerful promos and all. And I, I think that's one of the things that made it differently. Although, if you if you look at today's tune, I mean, uh, it's it's interesting how you can sell sell a company that that, that uh, lost sixty million. So, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> to, to to Fusion. I mean, and God bless them. I hope I wish them the best. But you have to look at the things uh, in the right perspective. I mean, uh, let's face it. Eric never invented anything. Eric either bought, borrowed, or stole everything. I mean, we had, uh, you know, he he came there, and luckily they backed him in, and he took all of the WWF stars and brought them to Atlanta. Therefore, well, he the brought, thing, brought some success. One, one of the things, I mean, I know that when you were there, I mean, the idea, it was not a novel idea, the idea of, like, getting Hulk Hogan or Randy Savage. When you were there, obviously, and Roddy Piper, all those guys, I know that there were periods where you had feelers, Talking to them and things like that, and even direct meetings with Piper and Savage. I don't know about Hogan. And and the the ultimate thing was is that, that in that period, the Turner organization was not willing to open the checkbook. And and it, the one thing Eric did that you get to credit him for was his ability to convince people to open the checkbook and and sign. Because I I don't know there was wasn't there a period where where you went and you had you had a meeting or close to a meeting with Savage, and then they just really be- base and Piper too, and they really wouldn't back you with the dollars to, to make the well, deal? Well, I, I think, uh, uh, with all due respect to Petrick, and I, you know, he's uh, he's still a friend of mine, but he was the stumbling block. And I think he misread uh, uh, Turner, what Turner wanted to do. Uh, Jack Petrick was known as, uh, if, it isn't, if, if it isn't paying off, give it to Jack, and Jack will make it pay off. Uh, and he uh, and his success in in some of those endeavors with uh, Turner Home Entertainment and some of those uh, uh, were very successful. He turned them around into money making entities. Uh, once we cleared the hurdles of uh, the Crockett's and the uh, contracts and, and existing contracts and all, uh, then of course. I mean, I used to go to uh, to venues, and Hogan would wave at me because I would sit way up in the, uh, in the top seats, and he knew where I was sitting. And and of course, the the meeting we had with with uh, with uh, 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 the other guys, uh, you know, we we had various meetings with them, but it, it turned into uh, a thing like you know, the, you you can't. Take a guy that's that's doing so well in in the, in the venue like New York and and bring him to Atlanta and and, and sit down and uh, and then embarrass him with an offer, which is what Petrick would do. 
and uh, and we had them, you know, walk out of meetings, and and and, and, and I and Petrick and I got into a hell of a fight over it because I wouldn't go to any more meetings with him. Uh, I mean, I would not sit down and try to entice uh, uh, Randy to come to Atlanta uh, and then give him an offer that was ridiculously low. So, you know, it, it kind of fell on deaf ears. And you're right, though. I mean, we we kept trying to make uh, an entity uh, make money, and under, and under Eric's leadership, I don't know who the hell the hell he who he convinced, but and of course Eric uh, is only interested in Eric. I mean, regardless, Eric's not a team player. Um, but and I mean, this shows not to say, hey, let's beat the hell out of Eric. But I hired Eric when he was then hadn't had a job in, in a year, or so you know, uh, as an announcer. And primarily, I hired him not because he was a great announcer, but because I was having troubles negotiating a contract with uh, with Jim Ross. At the time, uh, Ross was going to hold me up, so I hired another young, fairly good-looking announcer just to tell Ross that, well, if, if you're prepared to, to go all the way, then I will too. Now, in retrospect, I certainly didn't want to lose Ross. Uh, I think he, I think he's very good. He even uh, did a good job on XFL the other night, and uh, and has proven over the years that. That his ability to sell guys and sell angles and stuff is uh, probably unequaled uh, in the modern day uh, wrestling era. I just got the Ross report here. I'm just checking if there's anything uh, big here. Um, he's got a lot of stuff, but uh, it's mostly, let's see. China's book, if they only knew, is doing very well and seems to be very popular with female readers. I know my wife enjoyed it. <laughs> How about that? How's that for that one? <laughs> She she did too, by the way. Um, you know, Ross. It, I've noticed that Ross has not once praised that book. Uh, backhand. He sort of on TV ha when he plugs it, he has. Yeah, but not on the Ross report. He hasn't. No. Um, says Tajiri has not signed a contract, but is expected to do so this week. Uh, actually, Tajiri signed a piece of paper, but they haven't got it yet. Because uh, I remember I got called when he signed, and Jerry Lynn's contract should be waiting for him when he returns from his current road trip. Uh, I wonder when he will see. He's <laughs> see Thursday. See Jim Ross's schedule. Thursdays and Fridays, he's interviewing players and coaches to get ready for the Saturday games. Then Saturday night, he's got the game. Then Sunday, he's got to fly to the to where Raw is. Does Raw on Monday? He's never around. Uh, let's see. Look to the cat right to censor issue to escalate next week and to have presence at No Way Out. She's gonna do something at that pay per view, isn't she, Brian? She's gonna be naked. I know. Uh, Paul Heyman supporters. Oh, here's an interesting one. Paul Heyman supporters continue to contact me as if I am the obstacle that's keeping him from joining the Federation creative team. I'm not. I want him on the team. Also, some have used their ima active imaginations to misinterpret I'll drink his Kool-Aid line as a negative. <laughs> that flippant remark was not intended to be negative. I meant that I believe in Paul's creative ability and fully support him joining our company. It's a very political thing to say. Uh, let's see. Uh, talks about... Uh, Eddie Guerrero is probably at 75%, which is still better than most. Chris Benoit will be one of the biggest fan favorites in the Federation in 2001. Well, it's definitely been... <laughs> oh, Brian, you're going to love this one. Listen to this. Working with Jesse Ventura is much like I remembered from the days of yesteryear. Jesse is Jesse. <laughs> Ooh. How about that? <laughs> yeah. Uh, let's see. Um... He goes, from what I'm told, the Haas brothers, Scott Vick, Steve Bradley, and perhaps Murray Hopper, that's one of the Duffs, look at the best chance to advance the primary roster in the next few months. Uh, I'd like to get Taz more in-ring time. My intuition tells me that will happen. It's better off for Taz if he doesn't, but people Just like last night. Yep. Uh, X-Pac looks rested and ready to resume his career. I hope he can remain injury-free. Uh, there's a creative piece missing, and he needs to improve his verbal skills, but I love his work. McFoley will be in Dallas at a car show Saturday. He will not be returning to the ring anytime soon, and that includes WrestleMania. That's news. Huh. That, that's real news. He actually looked expect... him down last night. Yeah, because I do expect to see Mick back on television in the future. Mick's time is being occupied with his three children and his writing. A new Mick Foley book is on the horizon. Yep, sure is. Dean Malenko returns Sunday. Uh, we'll face Jerry Lawler in Evansville, Indiana. Well, that'll be an easy match. <laughs> Justin Credible will be in Evansville on Sunday against Kay Quick. Uh, Regal, his neck condition is improving. He's going to be going to Australia 
Uh, on March 21st to the 25th, uh, Lee just spent a couple of days in Toronto. We knew about that. Raw is 90% sold out. Kansas City's for SmackDown is sold out. Expect roster cuts to begin soon. Uh oh. Let the rampant speculation begin. <laughs> wow. WrestleMania. Boss the man. What? Boss, Boss man. Man's yeah. First on the list. Yeah. Uh, WrestleMania, the official insider story, will be out soon. Several Federation superstars will be promoting this book on the history of WrestleMania beginning next month. I'm anxious to see it. So that means he hasn't read it. Um, I wonder if that David Schultz story is going to be in there. Wow. Let's see. Uh, let's see. This is uh, Jim Ross talking about what people say about him about the XFL, which I'm sure is not very pleasant. I'm sure you've heard, or I'm sure some of you may have heard on sports talk radio or TV or in your local newspaper, uh, the rather stiff remarks some critics have made towards yours truly broadcasting of the XFL. I've heard and read, quote, what gives a wrestling announcer the right to broadcast football. Quote, he's not a bad wrestling announcer, but we all know what kind of people are involved in and follow wrestling. I really could give a damn what these folks think of my football broadcasting. I have had some experience with the game and consider myself a huge fan of football. I will continue to prepare to do the very best I can every Saturday night on NBC for the XFL. But what pisses me off are the shots these elite members of the media take on our fans. These assumptions are those of insecure, ignorant people who think we are all misguided, bad human beings for being fans of the business we love. Whew. How do you like that? Mm -hmm. I greatly admire and respect the fans of our business and always will feel sorry, and quite frankly, for those in the media who cannot relate to our fans' passion for our product. Critique and criticize me all you want because I can take it, but please do not crucify our fans in such an unjust, uneducated, unwarranted fashion. They don't deserve this kind of treatment. So, anyway, uh, that's Jim Ross. We'll talk more about that in a little while. Jim Hurd, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. So what do you think of all this, the well, politics of wrestling? I, look, I thought Ross did a pretty good play-by-play -play job on football. I mean, he, he can handle the play uh, as uh, he can't uh, help the, the talent <laughs> that much. No, but I thought, uh, and I thought, I think Jesse Ventura should have probably, uh, you know, you, you shouldn't fight with the NFL. I mean, uh, why even uh, why even try? So you're not on at the same time of year. Uh, if anything, you should embrace the NFL's players and hope they come to your games and and you gain something by association uh, with them. But uh, that's their bag, and uh, it's not a very good football product. Although I do like some of their in, uh, innovations uh, in it, as far as uh, as having to run kickoffs back and to the downing them and, and having to field punts without fair catching. I, I think some of those things uh, add to the excitement uh, of the overall uh, game. But uh, it's, a, it's a tough road on Saturday night, even uh, even with Saturday night for television being as bad as it is. I mean, it's a, if Texas Ranger, uh, Walker, Texas Ranger, can last all this time on Saturday night television, that tells you that the fair overall is really bad. Do you think it's going to yeah. make it? I well, it'll 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 make it if it if 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 they can get the ratings to to satisfy the adver uh, advertisers. I understand they're they're uh, they're uh, uh, promising a ten and uh, and they're not getting it. Oh, and that's an accumulated ten, the same way we used to sell and the same way Vince sells. I mean, they promise a number, and uh, if you don't make it, then you try to make it up in other areas and. Uh, and when we, of course, Turner, uh, they just uh, included us in uh, in a uh, in a package, sports package, which we made them, <laughs> made whole. By a matter of fact, because the only two things that ever beat us on the entire network was John Wayne Theater and the baseball. So <laughs> uh, it's a, it's a matter of uh, making it isn't uh, isn't the product totally. It's whether people will watch it. If they get enough people watching it, uh, yeah, you know, the, it will happen. I mean, it's uh, it's like trying to compare venue attendance with uh, wrestling ratings. Uh, there's a five or six million minimum uh, television wrestling fandom out there that never goes to the venue. Oh, yeah. And, and, and they support the television, and that's why uh, you can sell it, and that's why it draws a good number, and you're not going to change that. Uh, our biggest uh, missing factor when we were against Vince was the uh, 11 to 15, uh, which we never really, uh, really tried to do. I mean, uh, Dave will, uh, Dave will have some chuckles if I bring up the ding dongs. 
Oh, but, yes. But the, Everyone will. Uh, yeah, the whole world will. <laughs> but the premise was that the we, needed, we needed some we needed some some people that were getting the hell beat out of them every night to have some kind of of a shtick. And the original concept, and, and of course David Crockett screwed it up, was that there was a, supposed to be a huge bell in their corner, and every time they made a good move, they'd come ring their bell. And and then at the end of it, the you know the opponents would beat the hell out of their head over their own bell. But that's beside the point. Except that you have to find ways. I mean, when you have a small nucleus of talented wrestlers uh, that uh, they they cannot just keep killing each other and uh, and people uh, every every night although the business years ago was made you wrestle seven nights a week for you know for two or three months and then you take some time off but the the ability to attract ratings uh, is uh, is a is a whole different animal and all those all those day parts and all those uh, demographical parts, uh, uh, you have to have people equally in proportion to each one of them, or you're not going to get those kind of numbers. And I think Vince understands it probably better than anybody because after Eric stole all of his talent, he rebuilt his his situation, and uh, and look at it now, and he's just killing them. So you know, it's uh, it's it's one of the things that that I don't think everybody really understands venue versus uh, television ratings. One, one thing I think before we, before we head to this break, um, one of the things I guess that you probably, uh, one of the most controversial things mm-hmm. was your showdown with Ric Flair in 1991, right. uh, which led to Ric Flair going to the WWF right. um, over a contract dispute. Um, he, I guess, I guess basically he... Uh, in, in exchange for dropping the title, he wanted a, a contract extension. It was kind of a holdup. Uh, what was what was your side of basically what happened with Flair, and do you kind of regret it happening? Oh, regret it. I, you know, it was a stupid act on my part by allowing a an old. I really didn't uh, uh, really appreciate how deeply the Flair Dusty Rhodes uh, hate was for each other. And uh, when I made the mistake of bringing Dusty in as the booker, which was a you know humongous mistake for me, uh, prodded by Petrick and 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 ratings and uh, lots of different things make you do dumb things. <laughs> and but you got to look at my the other side of it. There weren't any uh, runways and uh, thunder cages and uh, and fireworks and everything before I came along because Vince Sears Hell didn't have them before I if you go back and look at the tapes, those entrances weren't around before Jim Hurd started them. But to go ahead with your question, uh Flair was was holding out and and it wasn't the first holdout. I can go back to when uh Flair I couldn't get Flair to sign a contract. We were at the uh we were at the Rosemont Horizon in, in Chicago. And uh, and it's time for the main event, and Flair won't come out. And I mean, the feet are hitting the floor, and uh, uh, I think the roof's coming in. And he and I are in a, in the shower, if you'll pardon the expression, trying to, to get him to sign a contract upside down with an ink pen that won't write straight up. It took us <laughs> forever, and I thought we were going to have a riot on our hands. Finally, we got it signed, and he goes out and and does his great normal performance and. And so, anyway, uh, but to go back to the original question, yeah, Dusty was Dusty uh, was uh, instrumental in in that, that deal. He won Flair out, and uh, and so they convinced me that we ought to not go ahead with the contract. And Flair uh, Flair jumped and took the belt, and they and they took the belt to New York. And as you most of your fans know, they uh, you know who is a real champion, what is a real champion? They uh, they. Uh, beat the hell out of the NWA belt and put it on their air, and I thought it was a pretty good deal. Um, as far as uh, some of the other things, there was a period with uh, Sid Vicious. You had Sid Vicious to a contract. Now, mm-hmm. what was the per- you, you um, basically let him out to go to Vince? How, how did that all break down? And he ended up going, you know, and Vince promised him the WrestleMania main event. That was right about the same period of time uh, where he was going back and forth. I mean, he was. I remember when he got the collapsed lung, and then he wouldn't go to the house shows, you know, to be in the corner. Right. And then he every week it was an or every day it seemed like it was a new story. He was there going to Vince or staying with you, kind of playing both sides against against the other, and he ended up going there, even though you still had him under contract. Well, he was look, 
Sid Vicious was a pain in the ass from day one. I mean, uh, you know, he he missed events. He uh, he, he he killed young kids. And, I mean, uh, breaking their heads. And we had, you know, we had lots of showdowns on whether or not uh, we even wanted him in our camp. And and finally, uh, you know, we didn't care whether we. He, I mean, here's a physical specimen that's unequaled in all of wrestling. I mean, and uh, uh, but we we just there was no way we could deal with him, and uh, and uh, he'd rather play softball than uh, uh, at home in uh, in Tennessee than to, to listen to us. So we didn't care if he went. In fact, we I was happy when he went. <laughs> well, actually, many other people were too. So and so well, and I'm sure Vince sometimes was happy when he went up there. So <laughs> 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 it's it's one of those things where you know. The whole the the whole issue is how do you how do you convince guys to to play uh, as a team and uh, it's such an individual uh, situation and guys uh, when when you sit around and try to get guys to put other guys over and all it's a long hard uh, it's a long hard road and and especially if uh, if you know things aren't going well. Uh, wrestlers are always looking to go to the uh, where the grass seems greener, and uh, and that's where I appreciate uh, really the loyalty that Flair gave me. I mean, uh, and and Sting and the Steiner brothers, and and the Steiner brothers were legit. I mean, you know, all you had to do is go to Japan, and and I would have taken the two Steiner brothers and put them against anybody in the world in a shoot and see you. They would win. They were that good. Uh, they have been misused lately, I think, uh, and I don't know why they allow it. But hey, they are great guys, and so is uh, so is the other guys. I mean, uh, even if I have to take a cover shot while Luger's pounding somebody. I'm going to read one email, and then we're going to get some stuff from uh, for Jim Hurd, who's our special guest today, former executive vice president of World Championship Wrestling. It says your poll about the best international star from Britain is incomplete and means nothing. There is one major oversight. How could you not have included Big exotic- Daddy? No, Adrian Street. Big Daddy never went out of England, so that's why. Uh, especially looking at a few of the other names that made the cut above him. <laughs> Every one of them was a bigger star. Well, I, I mean, well, even Aserati was because he was a big star in the uh, 30s. Uh, Adrian Street revolutionized the performance aspect of wrestling, and it was a great mat wrestler. Besides, what did Davy Boy Smith do but get into trouble with the law and ride dynamite's coattails? Um, yeah, he was a big international star for two decades until everyone forgets the... The last four years were not particularly kind to Davey, and, 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 it's, and it's his own fault. But uh, you cannot also overlook what the guy did from, like, 84 to, what, 96. I mean, he was a, he was a huge, huge star in England. Uh, uh, Steve Regal's good, but he hasn't done enough to be mentioned the same breath as Adrian Street. Uh, I totally disagree there. Bert Aserati, come on. Come on. Bert Aserati's considered, like, the toughest guy ever to come out of that country. Uh, I mean, he was... Bert Aserati was like a total legend among the wrestlers, more than more than any of these other guys, even more than Dynamite, at least with the guys of his era. Please tell me this was an honest oversight and not your opinion. These guys are better than Street. No, it was not an, o- an honest oversight. I didn't think Adrian Street's in their league. So, anyway, got that. Uh, this is for Jim Hurd from Rod Dixon, who goes, Dusty Rhodes on Observer Live in December blames corporate America for buying a Southern family business for what went wrong with WCW. He blamed... You and Jack Petrick and other suits for undermining his creative work. We've heard this analysis from every booker for the last 11 years of WCW, most recently from Vince Russo. There is definite clash of management culture between the Carney Southern promoters and the TBS executives. We've heard from the Carneys. What's your side of the story? I don't know if I classify Russo as a Carney Southern promoter. It's Booker. Okay. No, he's a Carney Northern booker. Yeah. <laughs> it's the same thing. Jim. Yes. What's your thought about all that? Well, you know, let's let's look at it this way. Dusty can say what he wants, but Dusty could never remove himself from every single angle so that we could get some work done. And and that's that's uh, inherent in most bookers that are still wrestling. They they and Vince Russo is a uh, is a, a prime example of a guy who thought in his own mind only I hope that he was a draw. Give me a break. <laughs> he should have been in the back room somewhere. I mean, uh, those guys 
interrupt angles. They upset the the flow of uh, of guys that are that that have the material to be pushed uh, to the top shelf, and for obvious ego reasons. Uh, and uh, it's it, you know, Dusty, uh, you know, Dustin Rhodes. Dusty's son is one of the great great kids in the business, and one of the nicest and fine performers you'll find. And he got in his way too. Uh, so, uh, you know, he can say what he want about the the hierarchy. Never ever interfered. He can say that I did, and of course I did <laughs> interfere uh, <laughs> in trying to break the the age old. I am the Booker, and 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 uh, you know, lots of guys had a lot of great great ideas that never surfaced, never got through the Booker's office, and and. I'm, I guess I had a larger booking committee than anybody at times uh, because I was trying to let some of these great ideas uh, move to the top. Uh, and uh, and it's one of the unwritten uh, situations. The bookers take care of their friends and themselves, and, brother, it is tough to break out of it unless you just fire bookers and start over, and then you get the same, same kind of thing, really. And what was your you thought? Pardon me. In, 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 in hindsight, what was your thoughts as far as uh, Ole Anderson? I mean, oh, you brought him. In, you brought him in as Booker. I mean, yeah. Ole. And in fact, there's actually some questions here. We'll talk about that in a second. But what were your thoughts overall on Ole? Well, Ole's. I thought Ole had some some great ideas, and and some of them came to the top. When the fact when we when uh, uh, when we uh, substituted uh, the 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 ghost for uh, for Barry Windham and all. Great ideas, and they worked. And uh, and uh, you know, if you look back at our ratings collectively versus Vince's, and you remove the the the, the kids that are the, from uh, oh, ten years old to fourteen years old, uh, we almost match Vince in ratings. If you pull out that demographic, but he had the kids, and uh, and uh, and uh, that's one of the reasons that that we never really. Uh, uh, equaled his ratings, although uh, our rating, as it relate, uh, related to the Turner Networks, uh, was one of the highest uh, um, that they had. And uh, and and when they when they looked at what it would cost them to replace the number of hours that we did, uh, it was astronomical in other in other program material. But uh, mm-hmm. I like Dolly. Uh, there's a there's a point where. If you lose the nucleus of talented wrestlers that you have, if you lose their attention, which Ole did, uh, then you have to make some kind of a change. And you either, you know, try it with a adding some more fresh people to the com- booking committee. And believe me, we had knocked down, drag out arguments at booking committees. Uh, and uh, but. The the age old phenomenon is that Booker's normally I think Johnny Ace right now may be a heck of a choice for Eric because he's a he's an open thinker he listens to other guys and he has no big axes to grind as it relates to his own his own uh, uh, his own push and I think it's so important and that's one of the reasons Vince succeeds so much he is the he's in total charge uh, he uh, he's uh, he's really used uh, uh, Jim Ross, I think, uh, to a to, to the best of Ross's ability, he he gets it out because Ross is a master at uh, trying to put uh, to, at building people. He really is on the air and off the air. And I um, it says, did you have an actual policy of using guaranteed contracts to develop new young talent, and why was so always why was always so opposed to guaranteed contracts, and what led him to being sacked in December of 1990? Uh, as I remember it, David, uh, it it wasn't really over wrestling. It was over some other stuff, and I blew my cork and said, "That's all fine. I've had enough of it." I, you know, and just made a change, and you know, which is not uh, not the brightest thing to do either. I don't want to spend time here telling all your fans how dumb I am because I'm not. Uh, it's hard to, to take it from the uh, from the uh, the get go with a with a broken Crockett empire and and build what we built we had uh, we re- we had some pretty good stuff we had uh, we had some great wrestlers and we had some good shows and uh, 
it's uh, it's it's not as easy as it as it may sound uh, when you're getting uh, uh, a lot of flack from uh, you know a lot of different areas. To I mean, even you holding up a sign saying we've heard enough. <laughs> that wasn't me. That was that was that was uh, John Hitchcock. <laughs> With your friend. <laughs> well, I haven't talked to him in years. I, I, mean, I, 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 I knew him. That was that was pretty funny. It was a good. It was great. We shot it. Are you yeah, kidding? I know. <laughs> can, Brian, can you believe they shot that on the air? Oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We've heard enough. <laughs> And he goes, is, is it true that Dusty undermined you and that you told him he cost you your job, but he couldn't book his way out of a, weight, a wet paper bag and that Dusty left the room white and speechless? Yeah. Well, and that's a true I, story? Well, that's a true story. story. And, well, on the yeah. other hand, I see, I went to Petrick at, and when it got to the point, and I, I told Petrick, I said, it's either me or Dusty, and he wouldn't fire. So, I, you know, I said, well, then it's me. I'm out. And that's when <laughs> the other part happened. And he can't book. He cannot yeah. take himself out of the the scenario long enough to book. <laughs> so I'm sorry. I mean, he's, now, a, question, he's question, a legendary wrestler. Uh, I can remember pleading with Sam Muchnick to bring Dusty Rhodes into St. Louis years and years ago. And Sam wouldn't do it because he didn't like his shtick. Finally, he did, and Dusty sold out St. Louis for so many nights you wouldn't even believe it because he was a great, great performer. And um, But, hey... Uh, you know, everything passes, and uh, it's unfortunate, but uh, I don't, you know, and now he's, I think uh, he's trying to resurface again. Oh, yeah. And which will, that'll fall on deaf ears. Today's fans don't want to, you know, I, you know, he can, he can get a pop in any arena. That goes back yeah, he to he knows like, how to do it. Huh? That he knows back, how to get a pop. <laughs> Why, well, yeah, but... <laughs> It's uh, well, he may pop a bicep or something now if he's not careful. <laughs> now, now in in 1989, uh, you brought in Rick Steamboat, and him and Flair had mm -hmm. probably the best matches maybe the company ever had. Certainly, certainly in that period, You're right. in '89. And then you and Steamboat had a disagreement, uh, basically a contract problem. Uh, what happened there? And do you regret it? Were you far apart on money? Was it just was it just impossible to deal with them, or was it just one of those things where you just couldn't make the deal? Well, it's another one of those little-known uh, efforts. In fact, I flew over and set it in, in uh, Ricky's home, uh, as I did with uh, with Flair at times, and, and we talked contract, we talked scenarios, and we had uh, we had allowed of of uh, if you if you look at it from back in New Orleans. Uh, Ricky Steamboat beat Flair with a uh, single chicken wing uh, hold, and which is a uh, which is a uh, give up hold. And when we went back on to Nashville, I'm 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 in a point where Luger is knocking on the door, needs his chance. So Steamboat would ref I wanted Flair to regain the championship with a double chicken wing, and uh, and uh, Ricky wouldn't do it. And, which is an outlawed hole in wrestling, and and that's the way it went, and so we parted company. And those uh, things. Uh, let's go to Gank. Let's go to Gank in Florida. Gank. Yeah. Yo, what's up, Dave? I appreciate you giving me the uh, China update today, uh -huh. and um, I would just like to say one thing about the Adrian Street uh, controversy. Les Thornton could outwork Adrian, Adrian Street blindfolded. That's all I got to say about that. Adrian Street was not in West, West Thornton's league. Adrian Street was West not a world class Thornton, worker, that. and I just watched him on tape last week. Um, I got a couple questions for you, Mr. Hurd. Go ahead. All right. Um, it seems to me that you know, earlier in the show, you were pipping Hogan and Savage as things that could have turned the company around if you'd been able to negotiate them. But all I hear from you is contract problem with Flair, contract problem with Steamboat, um, problems like negotiating finishes. That's what you were supposed to be doing. And you're talking about the ding-dongs here? The ding-dongs are not the issue. The issue is that you drove Steamboat away, you drove Flair away, and you basically killed the company. And, you know, when you left, that company was in much worse shape. If they hadn't gotten I, Flair I, back, I they would have went under. When I left, they they brought um, uh, Bill... Uh, 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 Kip Fry and then Bill Watts. Bill Watts then. Yeah, Watts after that Fry. That killed the company. Well, Watts was what just, you know, know 70s booking brought back. And then when Eric Bischoff leapfrogged everybody, he brought in Hogan and the entire WWF super group. Well, I'm, I'm aware of what Bischoff did. I'm aware of what 
you know, what Watts did. What I'm, we're talking about is what you did. Mm -hmm. And what you did was you created a company where the cupboard was bare. The cupboard was completely bare. And when WCW had somebody like Steve Austin in 94, they were so scared they weren't able to push it. They weren't able to push Steve Austin. So whoa, Austin whoa, whoa, that, that, WWF and you get Doug with the U.S. title. There was, there was, whoa, 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 whoa. You know, Steve Austin's a totally different kettle of fish. Steve Austin was, they, they, Steve Austin wasn't pushed because the company, for, I, I couldn't give you a good reason other than the company was, would not push young guys. Well, I see it as like Hogan's people coming in because the, the idea was Flair. Oh, hold, hold on, hold on, hold on, Jim, 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 go ahead. I hired Steve Austin, so don't, you know, but you're right. We, there's two, uh, two, take the Undertaker, for instance. We had him forever. We weren't bright enough to do uh, what they did with him because, uh, very frankly, he never smiled. He never had any, uh, you know, we were looking for some kind of emotion and all, and we weren't smart enough to make him the Undertaker. They well, did. why didn't you just why didn't you train him to do this? This is what Pardon developing me? a wrestler is meant to do. The guy worked territories, and the guy did all this, but it was the first time that he was on the big stage. Well, if you want to compare me to Vince, but Big Big Man is a smarter wrestling promoter than me. Okay, I'm comparing to you how I would book the company, and I'm nothing. That made you happy? No, no, no. That's not what I'm saying. <laughs> I also want to read you a flair quote. Go ahead. Um, this is in reference to his leaving the company in 91. Mm -hmm. I couldn't get along with this Jim Hurd. He kept lying to me and breaking his word to me. And um, you know, this is from the Ric Flair record book, the Steve Helwin publication. I mean, the thing that I'm getting from Mr. Hurd is a lot of dissemination, a lot of lies, and, you know, a lot of BS. And, you know, I just, I don't see anything that you've said in the last hour and 18 minutes that has really changed that. You're trying to apologize and, you know, make some sort of, like, listening? concessions for running a company to the ground. And why are you still listening? Why am I still listening? Because this is history, man. History. And I'm a, I'm a wrestling historian. That's what I do. That's right. And I'll go down in history as firing the only guy with the belt. And, and don't let me tell you something. Ric Flair and I got along much better than everybody thought we did. I'm just going by what he said, you know, for the record. And Ric Flair is a very politic person who doesn't say a lot of stuff for the record. He doesn't, like, drop a lot of bombs. He's not Shane Douglas shooting. <laughs> no, yeah. he's not. I mean, you know, Ric Flair is very politic. And when I hear Ric Flair, like, just dog somebody out, it makes me think, wow. Yeah, when I, I see Rick Steamboat so. gone, Ricky Steamboat, who was easy to book in every position he was ever in, I think, wow. And I think Jim Hurd is at the root of this. And no, this, is, this is the thing that you've got to confront. You've got to confront your legacy no, here. And when you do that, I'd like you to come to DeathValleyDriver.com and uh, make an appearance on the message board. Thank you yeah. very much. Yeah. Okay. I'll leave you to the call. All right. All right. Okay. Jim. <laughs> got a plug in there. Go ahead, Jim. No, I'm just, I just want to say that, uh, that and, and not in my defense, because I don't have to come up with a defense, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the ability to make the wrestlers happy when when Vince's guys were making a lot more money uh, and all, and uh, and we you know we we couldn't spread the wealth as you might say uh, to the point where we can make uh, enough of a stable happy uh, is unfortunate. But uh, that's the way business is. If if you own a shoe shop, remember someone may open one across the street from you and start discounting shoes. So. It's it's uh it's a legitimate beef on his part, and I'm I appreciate him being a wrestling fan. I don't care how he feels about me. This is from Kevin Donlin in Pasadena, who goes, "How difficult was it for WCW to operate within the uh, Turner Empire, and how much bull is in that chatter from the unsuccessful bookers? And did it take you a long time to become savvy to the politics of the wrestlers and listen through their personal agendas to make informed decisions surrounding your position?" Well, that's a lot. I mean, you know, it's uh, one of the things I think that, 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 that it's good for fans to know is that, uh, you know, one of the, 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 the possibilities that, that exists for, for, for you to establish a concrete format for wrestlers to understand, uh, it changes. It changes week to week. It changes uh, because you're trying to build stars and... and, and and various things happen that impede that, and and uh, so decisions uh, change now. We were, I think, we were handicapped a little bit. In fact, I I almost lost my job when we uh, when Terry Funk tried to to uh, 
to smother Flair with uh, with the uh, with the plastic trash bag. I mean, yeah. and uh, there was a huge meeting throughout Turner, you know, about it because uh, outside uh, activists were calling and, and instead of looking at it for for uh, entertainment, they were saying, you know, this is a bad lesson for our kids and all. So, to that degree, we were handicapped uh, through uh, through the organizations and. Uh, uh, and uh, our inability to get them to promote our our part um, of the thing, including the sports department. The sports department wouldn't even let me borrow a set uh, to put Joe Pettazino in. Uh, we had to build our own. So you know, it's hard to answer all those questions uh, in a, in a concrete fashion. But I hope that gives you some idea. What were you looking for as far as CNN coverage? Was it like? Uh... I don't know. You kind of wanted maybe like NBA coverage or something like that, or sure. what exactly did you want to do? All I wanted was for them to say we were alive and we existed. And uh, in fact, I was uh, in order to marry them because they didn't want to help. Uh, I was going to wrestle out of the atrium and uh, and uh, in uh, in CNN Center. I remember uh, that idea, yeah. In fifteen hundred foot atrium with their sign sitting out there and uh, and show the world that hey we are their brothers, <laughs> mm. but uh, it turned out the fact that that uh, the walkways around the top of that atrium uh, the crossovers were uh, were uh, were not strong enough to support the kind of uh, of uh, numbers of people that we wanted to put on them. Uh, in fact, um, we had uh, Hayes was going to come out of the out of that bar on the, on that second level there, and and uh, we were we would be looking for him for his bout and couldn't find him, and stumble over the over the banister and fall to the deck of the atrium, uh, which we had uh, put together. And uh, but we any, anyway, that's uh, you know, it's one of the reasons that uh, that, uh, that I think we we might have been uh, more successful. Uh, I think we were uh, fairly successful from the start up. But to be more successful, I think we needed uh, we needed the the association, and we needed them to bless what we were doing, and we needed the promo value on all those other networks. One thing that I remember, and this would, this would happen every year, and it was like I, I thought it was kind of embarrassing was like in um, and I'm I'm trying to get the years right. I would guess eighty nine and eighty eighty eight they did it, but you wouldn't have been involved in eighty eight. But in eighty nine, you ran a show. Uh, which was the Flair Steamboat match from Nashville, and then the WWF ran WrestleMania on the same day. Mm -hmm. And they bid, did a big CNN did a big feature on WrestleMania, and never in, and never even mentioned that they, you know their own sister company. That's right. They they did a uh, they even did a had a big show. Ha, was having a big show as well. They did the story on the WWF rather than us. Yeah. And that's I mean, uh, that's exactly the way it was portrayed. I mean, that's the way they thought about us. So anyway, it's uh, that's water over the dam. That's uh, they. Eric was uh, able to uh, to to get on the other networks with shows and uh, their full support, and I commend him for that. I don't know how the hell he got it done, but he did it. And yep. I think that's part of uh, part of his success was unloosening the monies and uh, and and the support. And you know, I know I know that. Um, you know, what was the thing? I mean, for a long time, you wanted you know the, the idea of the nitro. Um, for a long time, you had the idea of a of the of the going live. Thought right. that going live would help the ratings and things like that, and mm -hmm. eventually Vince McMahon went live, and then Eric went live, and yeah. they just uh, was, was it just one of those things where nobody else would go for it? Because I remember yeah, your did, idea for going live. live. We we tried to do the one, we hoped to get the Friday night show live, and mm -hmm. uh, and um, and but we just never could get it done. We couldn't fight it through. They wouldn't do it. And the, let's go to, the programmers, let's, uh, they were they were. Um, <laughs> they were bookers too. <laughs> we had a lot of help we didn't want <laughs> from from the wrong side. <laughs> Let's go to Chris in Toronto. Chris, you're up with Jim Hurt. Hey Dave, how you doing? Doing really good. Good. Uh, get the mandatory plug out of the way. Plug the chat room. Say what's up to everyone in there. And I had two okay. questions from Mr. Hurt. Go ahead. Uh, the first one is um, actually just comes to the top of my head. You just commended Eric Bischoff. Um, how can you commend the guy that lost eighty million bucks? <laughs> well, I think you, I don't know when you tuned in. We acknowledge the fact that we don't know how he could sell a company that lost sixty to eighty million and uh, and uh, did it on uh, talent that someone else made superstars. But but uh, he did, and I think uh, you have to put commendations where they're due. He was able to fight through the the 
hierarchy at Turner and unloosen the payroll and to uh, to get the participation of the vast numbers of uh, other people uh, with promos that uh, we never got. So, and I'm not crying poor mouth about it. Hey, uh, I can be I can live with history. Anyway, what's your second question? Um, a while back, uh, Tom Zink was on the show, uh-huh. and uh, I don't exactly know how to put this. <laughs> he was talking about uh, Sting not being able to draw flies, uh-huh. and he was in the back with Ole Anderson, and Ole said something to effect of, Sting makes 750000 bucks. You could line up everybody in the locker room, and he'd perform fellatio for that kind of money. Oh, <laughs> well, uh, you know, I'm, I wouldn't. Uh, that's number one. Steve Borden is one hell of a guy. Met his family and all, and uh, one great guy and one great performer. Uh, why he never, uh, we weren't able to break him into superstardom, I don't know. I, I just didn't have the, uh, the ability, I guess. But um, uh, he is a great performer uh, and a great guy. And, uh, and Tom Zink, hey, uh, ask Tom Zink uh, when I sent Wayne Coulter down to bail him out, uh, you know. Of jail, so and then he'll understand where everybody's. But at. who's telling the truth there? <laughs> Pardon me. Who's telling the truth? <laughs> about what? About what? About what specific issue? The I, I may know. <laughs> about uh, about uh, Sting? Yeah. No way. Okay. Don't believe. Thanks it. for your time, guys. Impossible. Okay. Hey, let's go to let's go to Mike in Connecticut. Hey, Dave. How you doing? Doing good. Hey, Brian, how are you, hey. Mister Hurt? Mr. Hurd, just a couple questions, and I'll, I'll kind of keep it very brief. Uh, Go ahead. Just, just a comment before I start. I'm probably one of the minority. I thought it was the right decision to let Flair go in '91. Um, really? Just just because You're something a minority. just because something doesn't work out doesn't mean it wasn't the right thing to do. And had Flair stayed around, they wouldn't have been forced as forced to get as creative with the booking as, at the top as they may have. Flair may have been a crutch to rely on for another year or two, you know. And just because Luger couldn't carry uh, the company doesn't mean it wasn't worth a try. I agree. At some point, you have to try something. If it doesn't work, doesn't mean it wasn't the right thing to do. Um, with that in mind, actually... Whoa, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. I'm, I'm confused. If it doesn't work, it was, if, it if was it the wrong thing it to do. If it, Dave, if it, <laughs> something doesn't work, sometimes, you know, you can give your best... I know, I, I, I know where you're, I know where you're coming from, but, but, but Luger, Luger, was, uh, <laughs> Luger wasn't the right thing to do either because... It, I mean, on every level, the Luger was champion. No, and, it didn't, it, it, it I didn't agree with you, but I didn't want to go as far as to, okay, then criticize Luger for being the choice, but, you know, getting four out of there still would have been the decision to, decision to make. Luger was the wrong guy to go with at that time, but at least okay. where leaving forced him. Maybe you could, you know, somebody else could have stepped him, maybe uh, maybe try Sting again. I don't know. I mean, that's going back ten years. Well, but. The problem was Flair was so was so entrenched that when, when Flair left, I mean, it really caused a revolt among it, the fans. Yeah, exactly. You remember all those We Want Flair chants at all those arenas for a year straight till, till Watts brought him back. So the argument could even be made that Flair should have been moved out of there a year ago. By his staying another year or two in 89-90, probably, you know, forced a reliance, you know, a crippling effect on the company in terms of creativity. That's what happens when guys stay just a little bit too long. You know, it becomes a comfort level type thing. Uh, they, they, I think Flair, I mean, as far as 89? Yeah, 89-90. I mean, I think... I mean, 90, 90 it got, rem- it, a lot remember, of things got bad in 90. Guys, you got to remember yes. one thing. Flair was the booker uh, in, in charge of the booking committee in 89. <laughs> 90, yeah. Uh. Oh, geez, you couldn't, 90. You couldn't tell that with him on top. <laughs> <laughs> um, my, my question, two, two questions, Jim. With that having been, been said, if you had been able to work things out with Flair in July of 91, do you remember what direction you were going to take? Obviously, he was going to drop the title probably, Luger. That plan was still in place. But what would you have done with him had he signed a two-year extension at that point? Well, uh, number one, he, uh, as I remember it, uh, uh, yes, we were going to we were going to take our chances on a Luger, and probably that would have been a mistake in retrospect. But we had very few very few ways to go as a, for a champion. That's right. We had Sting. Uh, we we tried to. In fact, we we one time tried to uh, split the Road Warriors. Uh, to see if we can move one of them up the up the uh, up the uh, tree, and uh, a hawk went on the ceiling in a hotel in Chicago, and we had to pull him down. He was so mad. <laughs> uh, anyway, uh, uh, and that's you know that's, that's where that's where Russo got the idea, Brian. <laughs> hey, yeah. <laughs> but uh, never... you know, we had very few ways to go as it relates to a champion of the stature of Ric Flair. 
Okay. And so, uh, you know, you, you deal right, with but, what you got. Well, and, and my second question, now, Dave may remember this being uh, quite the historian that he is, but uh, in 90, there was a... Uh, during the summer of ninety, on one of your Saturday night, your, the, uh, the Saturday night show, you had promoted one week that you were bringing Larry Zabisco in and billing him as the AWA champion, and at that time it caused a little bit of a talk. Of, and it was the dying days of the AWA, obviously. But if you think about it, it was the perfect match for the last ditch just to save the company, maybe as an interpromotional thing. He was billed to appear the next week, and he never did. Was there anything behind the scenes in terms of trying to work with the AWA at that point? No, I got you know it's it's funny, but. Uh, uh, Zabisco and I got along famously and never had any contract problems. Uh, and uh, as I re- as I remember it, and hey, you know, ten years is a long time to to, to look at some of these scenarios. Uh, uh, it's a, once again you're you're in the dusty roads deal, and you're trying to break through. Uh, what some people would call a book or glass ceiling. God, he he cast a big shadow, didn't he? <laughs> and it just didn't happen. So, and Zabisco, but uh, uh, Zabisco is a great guy, great performer. Good, good. Well, thank you for taking my call, Dave, Brian, uh, Mr. Hurd. Take care. Have a good weekend. My pleasure. Uh, bye bye now. Okay, thanks so much. You know, the one thing I think that that, that crippled everyone is uh, in in uh, Ric Flair in the '80s, mm-hmm. especially in '89. Ric Flair set a standard inside the ring, and he was, you know, Ric Flair was, of, of all the guys that you had, clearly at that point he was the best all-around performer. Um, no I mean, you know, Bo- you know, by, you know, Bobby, far, by far. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Bob, Bobby Eaton was very good in the ring, Barry Windham was also very good in the ring, but Ric Flair had the whole act together that they didn't have in, in areas that they didn't have. And when you try to go with, whether it was a Stinger or a Luger or somebody, they were all... I thought they were all great climbing. You know, people would get behind them climbing, but then when they were in the position, they were in Ric Flair's position, all of a sudden everybody looked and goes, they can't do a 30-minute match, and they can't do a promo, and they can't sell tickets on top. And it was one of those things where, because Ric Flair could do everything so well, and it, it, what would end up happening, like a hundred times, is that they would go with the guy, and then it would be like, God, and then they'd go back to Ric Flair. It was the, in That's a sense, right. it was the crutch. That's right. Uh, because yes. the, the, because the gentleman that caught two calls ago, or so, he's right. Uh, we had uh, we had to rely heavily on Flair. He and he uh, and I'll let me tell you something. Now, I don't know that you've ever seen uh, Ric Flair wear out a stair stepper, but uh, this guy was uh, an absolute phenomenon for being in shape. And you're right; he could go 40, 40, whatever you ask him to go. You want him to go an hour? He'd say fine. He would. He never, and he would blow up everybody. I mean that's just it. Uh, so, uh, but uh, you know, you're you're you were uh, we we tried to develop some some new young talent, um, but um, uh, it uh, it didn't work out. And uh, and as it, as the history will record it, <laughs> uh, the company under uh, under Eric may have got more ratings, but it lost three four times as much money as we did <laughs> in the long in the long run because they they mortgaged their future for two good years. Exactly. Uh, real quick, well, we got we got a full bank of phone calls for Jim Hurd. I just want to get through a couple of things. It's from Joe Bradley, who says you were talking about what Taz was calling Perry Saturn's Death Valley driver, but you didn't know what he was saying. I'm pretty sure he calls it the moss covered three handled family credenza. As far as what that means, I have no idea. Hmm. <laughs> I have no idea either. Uh, it says Mean Gene announced last night that Paul Heyman has sold ECW and fled to the WWF. If this isn't true, then WCW should watch what they say. Come on, Mean Gene. <laughs> <laughs> They should watch what they say. <laughs> mean Gene of the last ten years? <laughs> Next thing you know, it's going to be above the love sponge and confirmed. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, let's see. Um, let's, let's go to Mike in California. Mike, what's going on? Too much? Are you there? Yeah. I'm here, yes. Okay. Hey, Jim Hearn, I have one quick question for you and then something else for Dave. Uh, Go ahead. Uh, what's the best match that you saw while you were working uh, for WCW? What was the best match you saw put on by the company? Oh, the best match that I saw may have not been uh, available over here unless Dave retrieved it from uh, from uh, Japan uh, when the Steiner brothers. Uh, David, what's the name of that? Uh, oh, with Hase and Sasaki? A lot of people saw that here. Great, great. That was a great match. And, yeah, 1991. Uh, yes. One of the great, great matches of, of, of all time, as far as I'm concerned, going back lots of years. Uh, it was an absolute shoot match. And that's when they broke his, did they break his leg that night or? 
Oh, no, wait, that's a different one. The, the one, there was a match with uh, Izuka. That was in, I think, Jacksonville. Yeah. I'm not sure. Was it one where Fujinami and Izuka wrestled the Steiner brothers? Right. Where Izuka got hurt real bad. Exactly. That was in That was in the States. The one, the Hase Sasaki was the one at the Tokyo Dome. Great, great matches. And Flair had some great matches, too. And uh, my other thing is for you guys, Dave and Brian, uh, I don't know, maybe Jim's familiar with it, too, and I'd like to get his opinion. Um but why would uh, Jim Ross still be plugging and hyping up China's book after, like, it's been uncovered that a lot of it's just BS? And, I mean, why would he even want to, like, disgrace his little Ross report by even plugging a loser book like that? Because it's number three in the bestseller list. He report that he liked it yet. Because he's afraid <laughs> China will stomp him. <laughs> hey, they, they, plugged Ross, they, they plugged Ross' book, too. Yeah. You know? I just want to give that thing the number one. I mean, it's just it's it's just like a, hey hey you know the, the the worst thing that happened or the best thing I pro I don't know which was Foley's book because Foley's book set a standard and now every single wrestling book by the WWF is gonna well I won't say they'll all be terrible maybe these last two are just bad <laughs> even you know if Foley had written an average book these last two still would have been bad books what can I say but it's it's their product hey if they put on a really bad pay per view Ross has to come out on Monday and sell it sell the replay still has to sell the replay yeah yeah yeah. And uh, things you know, he has to plug, he might not want to plug, but he does. Yeah, like friend, like friends last Saturday night. I like that. <laughs> hey, let me tell you, I I know Ross very very well, and uh, Ross uh, uh, places no uh, uh, no ability at all to to not plug whatever Vince says, babe. And if anyone yeah. China's plugged, it's plugged. All right, and. Uh, you know, I kind of came to the hypothesis of why China did turn her back on all those people, and it was because ever since she was a young baby, she had uh, she was, she was used to those people, the people she respected and taught everything, to turn her back on her. So she, I think she wanted to turn her back on everybody before. You know, she's used to she like the way her parents like abandoned her, so to speak. Uh, I think that she just wanted to turn her back on on all these people because she's used to having people turn their backs on her. And I, I don't know. Do you guys agree with that? I don't know if it's necessarily that she wants to, but I'm sure that's what it is. Yeah, I think it's... I mean, you can't read the book and not know that her childhood was uh, just a mess. Uh-huh. Yeah, but she's, she, but the, the, there's, there's a certain bitterness that, that she had. Um, you know, I mean, especially when it came to some of the people in wrestling. That, you know, and, and like, I think the, the thing that, like, you know, maybe... Maybe, I mean, we don't know what her family life was, and we certainly don't know what her relationships were and things like that. But, like, the Kowalski thing, I mean, you know, it's like, you know, you can make fun of this foibles of Killer Kowalski and things like that, but it was in such a vicious way that, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I mean, I've known so many people who've known Kowalski, and, I mean, I've never heard a portrayal of him so vicious. You know, I mean, that I've was met him in really real life. He's really nice. Yeah, I mean, sure that one really... Man, he's great. Yeah, that one really turned me off because it's like, yeah, you know, you can make fun of him and being kind of old and, you know, trying to teach you a little bit of shoot stuff that probably doesn't matter in today's wrestling. But she, she wrote it, she wrote it in a way that was so cruel to him. I was thinking like, you know, he, you know, here's this guy who was a pioneer in wrestling, uh, you know, much better at, 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 in his era than she'll ever be in her era by far. I mean, not even a comparison. I mean, Killer Kowalski was a great card everywhere he went for, for 30 years. And 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 just to show him like you know to, to to treat him like this pathetic old comedy figure, I just thought it was so cruel. Uh huh. And uh, another thing was that I'm really surprised at the amount of Playboy issues she sold because I personally respect my masturbation time more than that. <laughs> I look at a picture of China, and that's like masturbating to a man. You know, well, it's, it's just wrong. I want I want to tell you that is. That is the sign of what a great marketer Vince McMahon is. Oh yeah, it really is. I mean, that's it's 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 got nothing to do with the girl. It's got to do with the marketing. He's you know he's taken women. I mean, from Elizabeth on, and you know a lot of them were very pretty, but he's made them. I mean, you could take. Hey, look at seriously. Tori Wilson was was prettier than all of these girls that Vince got over, and you know realistically WCW, you know they never got her near Sable. You know, look at what they did with Sable. Not that you know, look what they did with. Elizabeth. I mean, they made them phenomenal. Sunny would have been a phenomenon, except she self-destructed, you know, before they got her there. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll let you guys go and move on with the show. Thanks. Okay. Nice talking to you, Jim. Yeah, same here. Thank you. Take care. Okay, let's go to Dave. Dave, what's up? Hey guys, got a couple questions for Jim and a couple comments about uh, some ma some matches that have been highly rated lately. Uh, Jim, first of all, you need to liven up a little, because he is even sounding like, uh, 
Johnny Weaver on codeine so far tonight. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Johnny Weaver. I'll take the advice. But seriously. <laughs> but seriously, um, uh, you can't say you can't say that you had Mark Calloway in WCW forever and that he didn't show anything there because he only had him for about three or four months. That's right. Okay, because he kind of exaggerated earlier. I agree. Okay. Um, also, Hello. I don't hey, know how there? to put it, but how how did how, how did you come up with the RoboCop idea and did everyone in the locker room hate you after it happened? came out of a, uh, another division. It came out of Turner Home Entertainment. And oh, really? We, yeah. And yeah, we were asked to do it, and we... Uh, and we did it, and uh, and uh, unfortunately, it didn't do us any good. But that came from an, uh, you know, uh, Jack Petrick, who was uh, was uh, my boss, was also the the head of Turner Home Entertainment, uh, and they. So you know, it's another one of those things that that happens, and you, know, you do it, and you wish you hadn't done it, and you say, hey, let's keep on down the road. Yeah, uh, Dave. Yes. Wait, yes, I, can't, right, I can't hear you too well, though, but... Uh, Dave, I, go ahead. I, I saw the New Japan pay-per-view from December. Yes. With the match that you had as match of the year. Yes. I think I have to agree with you for that one. That match was awesome. Yeah, I mean, that I think has the deepest... Just the deepest psychology of any match I've seen in a really long time. Brian, Brian, have you seen that match in unedited form? Or that match at all? It was the uh, match with Nagata and Izuka against, uh, was it Kawhi and Masakuchi? No, I haven't seen it yet. Okay. I mean, try to get an, a 30-minute, you know, not the TV version, although it was excellent as a TV version, but, I mean, the unedited 30-minute, it's a really awesome match. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because, I mean, just the little things, like how after Fuji was in the Nagata lock for a couple minutes, how he was just staggering, and the only move he could hit on... Azuka was the drop kick to the knee, because, you know, because he could only spring off one leg. Mm -hmm. that I just love that. Great. I just love that finish because, like, that finish it was sort of like they had one minute to go, and they were just going to beat the hell out of each other for that minute because they knew that once the minute was up, you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. That was just a tremendous, okay. tremendous match. Okay, Dave, we got to get running because okay. we got to. I was going to okay. go anyway. Okay, all right. Let's go to Adam. Adam, what's up? Uh, I got four quick things, Dave. All right, okay. first, a gym. Yes. These people should just, you know, get off your ass, because you gave us Flair Steamboat, and that makes you a god in my book. <laughs> <laughs> Second of all, I just want to know, Dave, Brian, you guys have any ideas uh, when Shawn Michaels will be back on TV? And you Very know, soon. I got the impression either the pay-per-view or maybe, like, shortly thereafter. I think the feeling is is that, you know, they want to shoot the bi shoot his big return on paper. Like, if he does a run in and, and causes something to lead to something, or or just bringing him back, because the idea is to bring him back at WrestleMania, but not in the ring, and yeah. then have whatever he does there set up, you know, the next pay-per-view. I got the impression, you know, just from the Ross report saying that Foley's not going to wrestle and everything, that maybe they're going to hold Foley and Vince off and, and, um, and Shawn Michaels' return off for, like, April and May pay-per-views, knowing that WrestleMania's in the bag no matter what. Yeah, you know, they Rock got and Rock Austin, Austin and, well, with Rock and Austin, my 30 bucks. Yeah, yeah. In fact, and, and actually, I think it's a pretty smart strategy because why blow it all in April? Because it's it's going to be weaker in May and June. This way, you you hold some stuff off. Um, I, I actually think that's really clever how they're doing it. If, if they're that always is how they're doing weak it. in May and June, though. But um, last thing, um, China's. You know, I read her book. It was miserable, and I think she's kind of a bitch. But you know, <laughs> oh, and uh, for a good wrestling book, read yeah. uh, Scott Keith's book, The Buzz and Pro Wrestling. Good. Book. I, I'd love to. I haven't. I haven't seen a copy of it. But I'd love to see it. Get, try to get him on the show. He's a funny guy. Hmm. He's he's got an offer right now. Well, that's... Hey, hey, somebody somebody get me the book and somebody uh <laughs> somebody get me the book so I can read it first. Yep, you'll like it. It's entertaining. Well, but you know, that's all. You guys do a great show, and my favorite part of the show is you know your guys' smart ass comments, plain and simple. Oh. <laughs> Have a nice day. <laughs> uh, Jim. Yeah. Now, um, going back again, like uh, with the company going. You know, being sold and everything like this. Do you think ultimately, in the long run, that the wrestling in that environment, in that turn environment, could have ever been successful, or were there just too many things working against it to ever really have a long-term success? Well, you know, I really believe in my heart that if I if I uh, had had the support that, that that Eric finally broke through, that I would have been able to count a hell of a lot better than he would. And uh, and you could have come a hell of a lot closer to a 
to a, uh, a money machine like Vince uh, has put together. Uh, I think you, I think Hulk Hogan will uh, uh, will uh, will put together something later on. If uh, if he's not with Bishop, I think the competition is going to get very thin, so it's very thick. And I happen to believe that Brian uh, uh, Badal and uh, Greenberg better have a hell of a lot of money if they're oh, going to if they're gonna bankroll Eric mm -hmm. and his career. <laughs> they're they're really going to have to. This, I mean, they have to. They're going to look really closely at this thing because it's it's. They it's, don't it's, have a lot of time. No, it's if, a, uh, things. If don't they don't have a lot of money, if they don't have a lot of money, they don't have a lot of time. No. You got that right. Um, it has to happen now. And, but uh, but it can't. But the, but the problem is it can't. I mean, you can't turn it around now. There's nothing there to turn. There's no. There's no like. There's no Hulk Hogan to bring in to turn the thing around like there was before or 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 anyone. I mean, and, and the guys. You know, the guys. I mean, the, the 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 correct thing to do is really really build these guys for the future. But they, but they're years away. I, I, I mean, think you're. You know, I mean, like right. the like O'Hare and those people that we talk about all the time. I mean. Uh, I watched, you know, what was it on Wednesday night? Yeah. Oh God! Speaking of Wednesday night, Brian, I watched that match with the cat and uh, I and warned awesome. you. Oh my! God. Now that it was really fun. I, I mean, after you had told me, I mean, I was cracking up. Mm -hmm. That was so funny <laughs> watching that injury travel up that leg. Yeah. Oh my God. Guys, but, listen, I've got to run. I okay. Appreciate it. I want to tell all the wrestling fans. Just keep on firing and being bookers like you are so good at because that's what uh, keeps this whole thing going. And okay. uh, I admire, David, what you're doing. And, uh, Brian, nice meeting you. Nice and, meeting uh, you. Thank you for having me on. Okay, thank you very much, Jim. And. Uh